Hi there, I'm Pastor Cliff Gleason, and I want to thank you for tuning in today to our worship service. Here at the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church, we worship Jesus Christ as our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. And we hope that you will enjoy this service with us, that you'll be inspired by the teaching and the music and every part of our service. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you for being with us today. Now we have lots of room, don't we? Yeah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> What's that? this thing it's a stuffed what an animal what kind of animal what is it a dog, a dog. do you have anybody have a dog at your house oh these guys do these boys up there now our dogs our dog <laughs> yes do do uh, are, are dogs nice animals? Yes, sometimes. Yep, sometimes they're nice animals. That's okay. So they do. Do some of them learn to obey? Yep, some learn to obey. Can some learn to do tricks? Yes, some. Yeah. What kind of tricks? Oh, stand on two. Let's see if he can stand, stand on two legs. Shake hands. Would you like to shake hands? Shake hands. Okay, let go, please. What else can dogs do that can learn tricks? Flip. Flip. What else? Can you think about your grandpa, if he had a dog, what that dog would learn to do? Yes, that's right. Some dogs are trained to work with blind people and they are called seeing eye dogs because the dog can see but the person can't. So the, so the person holds on to a, a, what do you call it, a leash? A harness. And the harness goes around the dog and the dog walks and when the dog comes uh, to a place where there's a street, guess what the dog does? He stops, and he's trained to watch. He's trained to watch for the traffic, right? To find a safe time to cross the street, and the person holding the harness has to wait. And the dog learns many things to keep the blind person safe, right? Now, some other dogs have done other things. Sometimes, if there's a fire in the house and the family is sleeping. That's right, the dog wakes up first and he starts barking. <laughs> and he won't stop until the people wake up and get out of the house. And sometimes dogs save people's lives that way. Is that a good thing? Oh boy, that's a really good thing. Now, but somebody said sometimes dogs are not nice. Have you ever heard of a dog that's not nice? What do the dogs do that's not nice? They bark. They bark. Roar, roar, roar. Oh, sometimes they could bite you, and couldn't scratch. they? And scratch you with their I sharp claws. Scratch, yes. So, then what do you, how do you know if a dog is a friendly dog or a not a friendly dog? Suppose I came along and I had a real dog here. What would you do? If you saw the dog, would you run right over and try to pet it? That's not the safe thing to do. So what do you do? Hmm. I, I 
to do. Aha! That's right. Ask the owner. Is this a dog I can pet? And then the owner will say yes or no. Some some owners have to say no, no. He's not a dog that you can pet. He's too afraid of people or he's upset with something. Maybe he has a sore on his leg and he's afraid you'll touch the sore place and that would hurt him and so he would not be a good one to pet right now. But other dogs like my son, he has a dog named Cooper and he's a big dog. He's about this high and about this long and when he sees people he barks at them. But it's not because he's mad at them. He's saying hello. Because can, can a dog st speak and say hello with words? No. So he has to use barking to say hello. So what my son will do, or if I was out walking him, I would hold the leash so he doesn't scare the people. And then I would say, you can come close and pet him. He's friendly. And when people come over and pet him, he's always just stands still and he lets the people friend pet him on the head, and he's very friendly with them. So you have to know the owner and the dog in order to know if, there's, if the dog is safe and a friendly dog. Well, listen to the story, because uh, to the sermon today, because we're going to talk not about dogs, but about people, and sometimes people are afraid of this person I'm going to be talking about. But somebody else was going to say, oh, no, you don't have to be afraid. So listen to our sermon today. And thank you for listening to the dogs. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. May the Lord add his blessing as the pastor brings us his work. Some of you know uh, some Seventh-day Adventist artists. Uh, any of you remember Harry Anderson? Yeah. And now we have Nathan Green, who is doing wonderful work. And then there are non-Adventist uh, artists that have been known uh, through the years. One of them is Norman Rockwell. Anyone remember Norman Rockwell? And uh, the interesting thing with these three artists, they did something similar uh, as they worked. Before they actually painted a painting, they would have people come into the studio and stage the painting first. They would sort of paint the painting using human people before they painted with paints. So today we're going to do a sermon that we're going to paint a painting with people in order to give you a visual aid for the truth that we'll be looking at. Now in Romans 8.34, there are some things that Jesus has accomplished that Paul is pointing out to us. What's the first thing? It is Christ who what? Died. Who died. Was that important? Oh. All important, right? Could we have any hope of salvation from this world of sin if Jesus had not died? No hope. Everything rests on the cross. And that's why the cross is preached so much in the, in the New Testament. And it was preached in the Old Testament by what? 
Pardon? The prophets? No, the sacrifices. The, uh, the prophets did mention some things about Christ and they prophesied about him. But the, the way the people really learned about the crucifixion or the death of Jesus on the cross was the animals that were sacrificed in the temple day by day. So, uh, the death of Jesus, hugely important. We must never forget it. What's the next thing that's mentioned there in verse 34? He is risen. Is that important? Yes, because if Jesus only died and had not risen, then we wouldn't have a living Savior, would we? And would we have hope of resurrection if Jesus wasn't resurrected? Paul says we wouldn't. So that's hugely important that Jesus rose again. Now, uh, much of the world is planning to remember the resurrection with what's called Easter Sunday. That's just coming up in just over a week, isn't it? And, uh, but, it, but did God tell us to remember the resurrection through an Easter service? Is that in the Bible? No, what is in the Bible about remembering the resurrection? It's in Romans chapter 6. Pardon me? Not communion, that's the death of Christ. The resurrection is what? Baptism by immersion. People go under the water like Jesus going into the grave and they come up and it reminds us of the resurrection of Christ out of the grave. So Easter is not the biblical representation or the biblical celebration of the resurrection. It's baptism by immersion that is the biblical thing. So, so we do... Uh, we, we've heard messages about the death of Jesus, about the resurrection of Jesus. What's the next thing that's mentioned? He ascended where? Ascended to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. So that's important too, that he went up to be in heaven. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. What's the next thing that's mentioned? The fourth thing. Making intercession for us. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have spent some time on that fourth one. A lot of Christians do not spend much time at all thinking or preaching about the intercession of Jesus. But we as Seventh-day Adventists feel that that's an important work of Christ and that we need to study it and know it. And so we've been studying it and preaching it and writing about it for over 100 years. So let's look at that a little bit. This intercession of Jesus um, was taught in the Old Testament through the sanctuary service called the daily service. Why was it called the daily service? Because it happened every day. That's right. And the people would bring their, their animal sacrifices and the sins of the people would be put upon their animals and then the blood carried the sin into the first room of the sanctuary called the holy place. The blood was sprinkled before the veil and then the sinner could go home with no sin because the sin was taken off the sinner and brought into God's house. Now that represents how that Jesus died for our sins and God takes responsibility and the punishment for our sins. And so he takes it to himself and we get to go free. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Were they learning the gospel back then? When the priests were faithful and teaching it to the people and they understood they were learning the gospel, the good news that God loves sinners and will take care of things for sinners. How many of us is that important for? Yeah, all of us because we're all sinners, right? And so that's very important. So we want to know what, what is it about the priests? Now we know that the sacrifice represented Jesus, but the priest also represented Jesus. And that's his intercessory work. So we're going to be looking at that this morning. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to have to go fairly quickly because we have a lot in this subject and we want to get it all in so that you have a complete picture when we're done and not a skewed or lopsided picture. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And here John writes this. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
Now, Christians have looked at that and said, oh, we have an advocate with the Father. That sounds like God the Father is a judge. Now, does the Bible talk about judgment, by the way? Yes. And does it talk about God judging his people? Yes, it does. So they said, okay, those verses about judgment combined with this verse about being Jesus being an advocate, we know what that is. That, that's right in our human courtrooms. We have a judge who sits up high, right? And who hears the case and who's the advocate? Well, that's the attorney who's working with the accused person. And who's the accuser of the, of the sinner, the, the person? That's Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. So they said, okay, there's our human courtroom scene. We, we have that picture. So uh, I'd like to have um, some volunteers at this time to help me illustrate this. So here's our throne. And we need someone uh, with white hair. Dan, would you come up? <laughs> now, why am I choosing white hair? That's right. In the descriptions of, of the prophet seeing God, they always picture him with white hair. And that's because it represents um, wisdom. And so Dan is very wise, and we're glad to have him serving in that capacity. Then I'm going to ask Mike, would you come up, please? Because we need a young man here. And uh, Mike is younger than Dan, I believe. And so Mike is going to represent Jesus, the advocate. Now we need someone to be a sinner. It can be male or female. And do we have any sinners in the house? Do we have a volunteer sitter who would come up for a few moments and help me? Okay. John, would you come up? You're a good sinner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we'll have you stand over here, right here. And I won't ask anybody to portray Satan, but we'll just think of Satan as being over on this side, kind of pointing his finger and say, you know, that John, he's no good. He doesn't deserve to be in heaven. And would he be right that John doesn't deserve to be in heaven? Yeah, the Satan doesn't tell the truth very often, but that's, that's a partial truth there, isn't it? So we picture Jesus then. Put, it, put your arm around this poor sinner here. He needs some comfort and encouragement. And we picture Jesus appealing to the Father and saying, Father, please be merciful to this poor sinner because he's weak, but he's put his trust in me. And I am going to represent him. So look at me instead of looking at the sinner. So we picture that because that's more, that's like a human courtroom, isn't it? Now, uh, would you step back a moment here, John, over here behind this blue line, facing the father there. That's it. And you stand right in front of him. That's it. Now put your arms out straight like this. Now, some of you have seen an artist rendition of this portrayal of Jesus interceding for us. And they have Jesus standing like this. And the light of God's glory is cast upon Jesus. And what shape of shadow does it make? A cross. And so John is approaching the throne. And, or the sinner is approaching the throne in the shadow of the cross. Now, there's a beautiful thought in there, isn't it? Because it, it reminds us of the importance of the cross, that without the cross, we have no hope of being accepted by God, so to speak. So uh, we've, we've had those two pictures, but they come from a, a, a human courtroom kind of idea that we're using with 1 John 2, 1, where it says we have an advocate with the Father. Someone who comes between the father and the sinner. But does that, does that fit with other parts of the Bible? Turn to John chapter 16. Well, and while you're turning there, oh no, John chapter 5, that's the one. That's why I was a little bit off there. John chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, would you mind staying here for just a moment while we look at a couple of things? The Gospel of John chapter 5 chapter 5 and verse 22 
And notice how, it's, how Jesus is speaking here. He says, for the Father judges who? No one. No one. No one at all? Well, that's what it says. No one. But has committed how much judgment? All judgment to whom? To the Son. Oh, ho. Well, now, if the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, then is there something wrong with our picture? There's something wrong. We've got to, we're going to have to adjust that. But hold on. We're not going to adjust it yet. We've got to look at a couple more things. Remember what it said in Romans 3, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 34. It says, Jesus who died, who has risen, and who has ascended where? To the right hand of the Father. Is Jesus at the right hand of the Father in this picture? No. So that's an adjustment we're going to have to keep in mind that we have to make. So, But let's look at one more. John chapter 16 and verses 26 and 27. John chapter 16, 16 verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, in that day, in other words, in the future, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you. Now notice that. Will he do it or won't he? He won't. He won't do what? He won't pray to the Father for you. Now that's another problem we have, isn't it? Because in this picture, or the other one, we had him praying to the Father for the sinner. But Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. But let's look at the next verse to clear it up. For the Father himself, what? Loves you. I don't have to pray to the Father to love you. The Father himself loves you. And uh, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. So, so the Father himself loves us. And we'll see more about that in some other verses later on. And then John chapter 14. Well, also in John. John chapter 14 now. And look at verse 9, chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, he's talking to Philip. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen whom? The Father. He who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So is the Jesus different than the Father or the same as the Father? The same. So if Jesus loves us, then the Father what? The Father also loves us the same way. So let's change our picture. We saw in Romans that Jesus ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. So come up here, Jesus. And let's move this chair back. All the way back to its original place. There we go. And let's bring that one out, please. And I'll bring this one out. And if you'll sit here. All right. Now, do we have Romans 8 correct? We do. Okay. Now, what about John 5, where Jesus said, The Father judges how many? No one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, is, is that a good place for judging? Is Jesus at a good place for judging? Yes, he's in the place of authority now. He's not down here just to be an advocate. He's up here where the judge sits. So now we've got that correct. What about John 16? Where I, will talk, I will not talk to the Father for you, for he already loves you. So now we've got the Jesus. And the Father the same. They're both the same position toward the sinner. All right, let's look at something else. Here is the throne of heaven. Now, I wish we had a bench here that would seat two people. It would portray it better. Because he's sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne. And there are verses in the Bible where it says that they share the throne. We're going to look at one. It's in Rome. It's in Revelation 3. It says, I sat with my father on his throne. 
Now, if we have a piece of furniture that's not made for one, but for two, what do we call that here in America? A love seat. So the throne of heaven is a love seat. Now, in the sanctuary, the throne of heaven was portrayed in the most holy place as the lid, the covering, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. What's the name that people have given that? The mercy seat. Now, mercy seat doesn't actually appear in the Bible other than that the translators put that there. Uh, I think it was Martin Luther who thought of that translation. Uh, but mercy seat and love seat, that's pretty close, isn't it? So the love seat, father and son together. And in fact, in the holy place, the first room of the sanctuary where the daily took place, there, were, there was a table of showbread and there were two stacks of bread, one representing the father and the other one representing the son because the table of showbread was the throne of God in the holy place. And the, those, two, those two stacks were even. All right, so let's see something else here. Um, now we have the father and son on the love seat, on the throne. The sinner is convicted about his sin. He wants to go to God with his sin, but the sinner hesitates. Because as sinners, do we feel guilty? Yes. Do we feel ashamed? Do we feel unworthy? That's right. And Satan dumps that on us and tries to make it even worse. So we hesitate because we wonder, can I come to God with my sin? So who is sent from the throne to the sinner? The Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He points us to the Bible. Remember we learned about the exceedingly great and precious promises. And so the exceedingly great and precious promises, the Holy Spirit helps us to realize anew that God is a God of love and forgiveness. So the Holy Spirit says, look at the throne, sinner. See Jesus. He's on the throne. And look at his attitude. Now what would the attitude of Jesus be? Put your arms out here. You want him to come. Yeah, that's it. Now look at Jesus. See those hands stretched out. He wants you to come. And what would the sinner see in the palms of Jesus' hands? The nail prints from where he died for the sinner. So what is the sinner reminded? Jesus loves me so much he died for me. So is, he gonna, is Jesus going to reject him or hurt him in some other way? No way, not at all. But so he looks at Jesus and then, uh-oh, but the Father is there too. That's scary. But Jesus reminds the sinner, what? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So what about the Father's arms? Uh, that's right. So the sinner now comes and just put your knees right on, this, on the center there if you can. It would be comfortable. And then the arms go right around. And the sinner's accepted. Okay, you can get comfortable from, or is that, is that un, not uncomfortable? Yeah, sure. Good. So the sinner's accepted and the arms go around. Now put your arm around him again. And so, the, so there's, a, there's a family squeeze that happens at the throne as the sinner's accepted. But also when the arm of Jesus goes around, what does Jesus wear? A robe, a white robe of righteousness. And the sleeves, are they short sleeves like mine or do we have longer sleeves? Long sleeves, so the long sleeve of, Job, of Jesus' righteousness covers right over the sinner. Have you ever heard about us being covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness? And so in that acceptance, he's accepted and loved and he's covered by the robe of Christ's righteousness. Now Jesus loves us. We see his scars. The Father has scars too, but not on his hands. Where are the Father's scars? On his heart. Because he had to watch Jesus go through all that and not intervene to save Jesus from the hurt. 
but he went through it for our good. Let's see. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians. You may t be seated now. We'll use you back in a little while. Perhaps. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now notice that when it says all things are of God it must be speaking of the Father because it says he has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So the Father was in Christ. In fact we go down to verse 19 it says that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself at what event was this particularly true at the cross at the cross the father and the son were working together to reconcile humanity to themselves, both Father and Son. So the Father has always wanted reconciliation. Now the cross is crucial because that's where the, the, uh, the price was paid so that reconciliation could be done. And the, um, the Father was working with Christ in that. Now, reconciliation um, is between two people who have been at odds. They need to be brought back and reconciled. And who needs help to be reconciled? Does the Father need help to be reconciled to us? Or do we need help to be reconciled to the Father? It's we are the ones. Because look at Adam and Eve. What happened when they sinned? Where did they go? Did they run to God with their sin? They hid from God. And we've been hiding from God ever since because we are ashamed and afraid to come as we are. So the intercession of Jesus is not directed as if he were down here with the sinner toward the Father saying, please be merciful to the sinner. Instead, Jesus is up here with the Father and he is saying be reconciled to God. So his intercession is not directed to the Father. It's directed to us to come be to the Father. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and let's look at verse 14 to 16. Hebrews 4, verses six, 14 to 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now notice there in verse 16. Jesus is, is appealing to us and the Holy Spirit appealing to us to come to what place? To the throne of grace. And with what attitude or what demeanor? Boldly, confidently, with great assurance now where does that assurance come from? Where does that boldness come from? It comes from knowing that Jesus died for us because of the nails in his hands. And the Father loves us the same with the scars on his heart. And he so wants us to come. And then can we come confidently? Yes. When we've accepted that truth, when it has become part of us, we come boldly. And we know that if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. And we'll always be received, be forgiven, be cleansed, be healed, 
be loved and strengthened to serve him. I like the song. It says, he looks beyond my sin and sees my what? My need. God knows he has to deal with our sin, but it's the need that led to the sin that he really wants to get to because that's the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that people don't know God well enough. Because if we knew God well enough, we wouldn't want to be separate from him. We'd want to be with him. And sin really is being separate from God or the way John says it, it's lawlessness. It means to get away from God. But we don't want to get away from God when we know how good he is to us. So we're reconciled. That's what he wants. So the picture there is that Jesus is an advocate with the Father. Not with the Father this way, between the sinner and father, but father and son both appealing to sinners to come to the throne of grace. <laughs> Excuse me. Now what kind of a throne is it? A throne of what? Grace. Now what is grace? Grace is an attitude to be generous and kind and giving to people who deserve to be what? Punished. And even rejected. So sinners who are faulty and failing can come because God's attitude is I want to help you. I want to bless you. That's grace. Now if if it was a throne of merit then it would be that people would earn their way to come heavenward, to come to the throne. They would be down here saying, oh, I've got to fix myself up. Let me see. I've got to shine my shoes and, and, and wash my suit, and then I can come. But if we try to do that, will it work? It will never work because we don't have in ourselves the ability to produce any pure righteousness. And so we'll always fail. And how many times would we ever come to the throne? We'd never come. And that's what Satan hopes for. That's why he dumps on you. And you've had experience like me that he says you're a horrible excuse for a Christian. God doesn't want to see your face anymore because you have blown it too many times. And so we hesitate. But God says, no, this is a throne of grace. This is only for the people who can't do it. This is only for the people who are weak and faulty and who fail all the time and who could never measure up. This is a throne for them. And anybody who thinks that they have got it together and now they can present themselves to God, don't bother coming because this isn't a throne of merit. It's a throne of grace. Now, there in Hebrews, when does it say we should go to the throne? Come to the throne boldly to receive what? Grace and mercy in what time? In time of need. In time of need. Now, when do we need grace and forgiveness? When we've fallen, right? When we've messed up. We need to be forgiven of those things. We need the grace of God. And so when we've fallen, we need not hesitate. We can go immediately because we don't need to fix ourselves up first. We go just as we are with our sin to the Lord. Just like the people in the Old Testament, they weren't supposed to wait. They had to bring their sacrifice right away and come. And it was a sacrifice God had provided for them. So we come as we are. And we're covered by that righteous sleeve of Christ's righteousness. And our filthy rags are removed. And we're covered with his robe. You know the Bible talks about the woman who reached out to touch something in order to be healed. What did she touch? The hem of his garment. And what happened to her? She was healed. But do you know there's a place in Matthew 14, 35 and 36. It says... And many people came and touched his garment. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. 
I always thought it was just one woman. But there in Matthew 14, verses 35 and 36, it says there were many who came and touched the hem of his garment. Now where is Jesus in the hem of his garment now? He's on the what? The throne of grace. And when we come boldly up and his garment comes across us and that beautiful garment of his righteousness comes on us, it's a healing garment. It's a healing experience for us to be accepted, to be understood, to be loved, to know he's compassionate toward weak, faulty sinners. And it changes us. We're made perfectly whole. You see, it's not about you, whether you're a sinner. How many of us are sinners? Everybody, there's no question about any human being whether they're a sinner. The whole issue is about God. What about him? Is he a forgiver? Is he a healer? Is he a strengthener? Is he one who can make us all together new in Christ? That's the question. Is he a savior? Now, the test, if you ever thought, what's the, how could I test how mature a Christian I am? The test is this. When you've sinned, now we keep sinning even after we're mature Christians. When you've sinned, how fast do you get to the throne of grace? That's the test of your maturity. It's not how often you sin or don't sin. It's how fast you get to the throne after you've sinned. Because if I'm a more mature Christian, I'm learning more and more about the grace. Isn't the Bible say, grow in the grace of Christ? So when I'm growing in the grace, then I'm growing in my boldness to come to God just as I am, even immediately after I just sinned. Because I don't need to do a thing about me. It's God who does something about me. I run to him. Because my confidence is in him. You see, the Holy Spirit helps the person to look to Jesus first and then the Father. Does the Bible say anything about looking unto Jesus? It says looking unto Jesus, the what? The author and the finisher of our faith there in Hebrews chapter 12. So we're looking to Jesus. He's the one who gets us believing in the goodness of God and he brings us to a complete and finished understanding of how wonderful the Father's attitude is toward us. And that's what makes all the difference. Now there's another time of need, not just when we've blown it, but there's a time of need when we're tempted. When we're tempted. Because when we're tempted, do you think God would want us to run to him before we yield to the temptation? Yes, the Holy Spirit says, oh, you're tempted, look at the throne, because who's on the throne? Jesus, the high priest who was what? Tempted. In what way? In all points like we are. So whatever temptation, bring it to Jesus. And Jesus, will he say, oh, come on. Get, get yourself fixed up there and just do the right thing. You know. That's easy. I did it. It was no problem. Is that what Jesus says? What does it say there in Hebrews? It says, we have a high priest who, it uses a negative it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So we put that into the positive since it's a double negative. So we do have a high priest who can sympathize with what? Our weaknesses. So if we feel weak, like, oh no, this is another temptation that I've blown it so many times and I'm weak again and I want to, I want to do it. And we run to Jesus. Will he understand? He'll say, I know it's hard because I felt it too. I was tempted just like that. Isn't that what the Bible says? Tempted in all things. And so he will sympathize. He will understand. He will accept us. And he'll help us in the time of need and give us a way of escape. So if we're coming to God, when we've already blown it and we run to the throne. And if we're coming to God when we're tempted and we run to the throne so that we'll find that way of escape from the temptation, how often will we be going to the throne? 
all the time. All the time. And what happens every time we come to the throne? The arms of love. The family squeeze. Because we're always accepted and loved and understood and there's compassion and there's patience with us. And so the throne becomes the place that we feel safe and secure. It's just understood. Now on earth there's a place where we feel safe and secure and accepted and understood. What's that place on earth? It's home. That's a kind of the definition of home, isn't it? So through the experience of coming boldly to the throne of grace in every time of need, the throne becomes our home. The throne of God becomes a place where mo we feel most safe, most accepted, most understood, most loved, most forgiven. The throne becomes our home. Not just but with Jesus, but with whom? With the Father, too. We feel very loved and accepted by the Father. And it's, the, it's our home. Now, if the throne is our home and Father, we feel we, we sense just as much love from Him as the Son, then do we need any more someone to convince us to come boldly to the throne? We don't because we're there. We've experienced that acceptance and love so often, so beautifully, so strongly, so wonderfully that we don't need somebody to convince us to the throne. We're going there all the time. And so we can live in the presence of a holy God without an intercessor. Because we don't need anybody to convince us, to intercede for us to come. We love to come. It's become part of us. We can live in the presence of a holy God without an intercessor. Because the intercessory work of Jesus is all complete for us. He's convinced us that this is the place for us. And we've experienced it and we love it. Now, let's see, we'll have to save the rest of this for another time because our time's way past. We've got some other things that we'd like to share, but they're additional material. This is the important part here. What we see is a new picture, I hope, for you, for those who haven't heard this message before. I've preached this before here. But we have a lot of new people and I've had several requests to preach this again. So I've shared it today. And it gives us a new picture. When you pray, you can have a picture in your mind of going boldly to the throne of grace. You can have a picture in your mind of Jesus accepting you and the Father accepting you. And that when you're talking to one, you're talking to the other and they're in agreement. And when you intercede for other people, when, you, when you're thinking about God answering your prayers, it's no longer uh, Jesus trying to convince the Father of anything. Now, it's Jesus and the Father saying, we really like what's happening here, or we really need to do something. Let's take the plan that you and I have already put together and let's put it into action. See, they're together in everything. They're together in reaching out to your heart and, and working out your salvation for you. Let's pray. Father, today as we look at this picture of the intercession of Jesus and understand that, that you love us just as much as Jesus. In fact, if it would have been a little different, you would have been willing to come and die for us just as much as Jesus. You, you were indeed willing and you would have been the one. And all the love and all the grace and all the sacrifice would have been just the same. But it must have been awful for you 
to watch Jesus suffer and not intervene. But you did it for us. And so we know that your throne is indeed a throne of grace where we can come just as we are. We don't have to fix ourselves up. We can come and you'll always understand. You'll never embarrass us or hurt us in any way. You won't just lecture us. You'll receive us and throw your arms around us and love us. In fact, it's your favorite thing to do to receive hurting sinners. So thank you for this picture that we have as Jesus explained things. And we look forward to the day when we will be brought to heaven by Christ and we'll see your actual throne. We'll see you and we won't be afraid. We won't be afraid at all. And we'll know that you love us. And we will love being in your presence. So thank you that today we can come boldly to your throne and experience the greatness of your love even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, I want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us through the media. And we're glad that you were able to enjoy this particular service. But we're hoping one day will come when soon you'll be able to come right to our facility. We're here at 241 Province Street in Laconia. And our services are on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock for the worship service. 9.30 if you want to come earlier for the Bible study. You're always welcome. We'd love to have you come. And there's a special thing that happens on the second Saturday of every month. That's our fellowship meal. And we'd love to for, you, for you to be able to be with us and to stay afterwards and enjoy the lunch with us. Now, you may also be inspired to want to study the Bible some more. And we do have different Bible study aids. We can provide something for you to study through the mail. Or we can come to your home. Or we can arrange a small group study here at the church. So be in contact with us and we will be able to set up something that will meet your needs as best we can. Thank you again and we look forward to meeting you. God bless you in every way.